So today we are going to be talking about the transient analysis of first order circuits. So the title of this lecture, and actually we'll be talking about this topic for the next three lectures, has a bunch of words that you guys probably are not super familiar with their meanings. So let's start with first order circuits. So first order circuits are circuits which contain one, and I'm putting this in quotes and we'll talk about that in a moment, energy storage element. Like an inductor, or a capacitor. Okay. So what I mean by one energy storage element is it can actually contain multiple energy storage elements as long as we can combine them into a single equivalent inductance or capacitance. We can treat it as if it was a first order circuit. If it contains multiple energy storage elements that cannot be combined into a single equivalent capacitance or equivalent inductance, then it is a higher order circuit, okay? So typically speaking, we call first order circuits RL circuits, meaning they have some single equivalent resistance and equivalent um, inductance, or RC circuits where they have some single equivalent resistance and some single equivalent capacitance, okay? So that's what we're gonna be dealing with in this class. Uh, so now let's talk about this concept of transient analysis. So in, to introduce this concept, I'm going to draw a circuit and we're going to talk our way through analysis. So let's consider the following circuit where I have a practical current source like so over here on the left hand side and then I have a simple RL circuit over here on the right hand side and our practical current source is connected to our RL circuit by a switch and this switch is going to open at time t e is equal to zero. So we are going to consider t is equal to zero minus to be the moment before the switch changes state. And by that, I mean, if it was closed, then this is while it's still closed. If it was open, then this is while it's still open. And then we're gonna have, oh,
All right, sorry about that. So T is equal to zero minus is the moment before the switch changes state. T is equal to zero plus will be the moment after the switch changes state. And T is equal to infinity will be a long time after the switch changes state. I've identified these three different times that we're going to be dealing with in our analysis because we're going to find that the circuit effectively behaves differently at these three different points. And the reason why the circuit is going to behave differently is because we are introducing something new when we open or close that switch. We're making a connection or we're breaking a connection that is going to change the electrical characteristics of the system as a whole. Okay. So let's identify a couple of quantities here that we may be interested in. The first of which will be our inductor current, IL, as a function of time. Then we may also need VL as a function of time. And I'm going to put VR as a function of time. And the reason why I am putting the positive polarity terminal on bottom for our resistor here is that after that switch opens up, our inductor current will be flowing through the positive polarity terminal. So what our goal is for the next several minutes is to determine, actually, let's move this axis here, how our inductor current I L of T behaves as a function of time. So, the time t is equal to zero minus is actually representative of how the circuit is behaving for all time less than or equal to zero minus. And so what I mean by that specifically is when that switch has been in its current position, in this case, we would consider it to be closed for a very long time, we are effectively dealing with a DC circuit, okay? So whatever value our inductor current has at T is equal to zero minus, it will also have had for all time before T is equal to zero minus. So by inspection, what do you guys think that current is going to be? If you're not sure, that's okay. We can actually analyze the circuit. So at T is less than or equal to zero minus, what our circuit is going to look like is this guy. We have RS in parallel with our independent current source IS. Over here, we have R. And over here, replacing the inductor, I have a short circuit. So I'm replacing my inductor with a short circuit because we are treating this case as if we had a DC circuit, right? At T is less than or equal to zero minus, my switch is also closed. Here's my inductor current. 
I L for zero minus. Here's my inductor voltage. VL for zero minus. And here is my resistor voltage. VR for zero minus. So I'm going to ask my question again. What do we think the inductor current is doing at T is equal to zero minus? You're absolutely correct. So, um, Daniel says that he believes the inductor current IL at zero minus is simply all of the current that is being supplied by our independent current source IS. That of course makes sense because our inductor is effectively shorting out the resistor R and the resistor RS so that no current should flow through them. So I agree with that wholeheartedly. Okay. So, If we plotted things here, let's consider this value to be IS. So for all time up to T is equal to zero, our inductor current has this fixed value. We are going to consider this a DC steady state condition for our circuit. So effectively we've treated it as a DC circuit. Let's say that way out here is T is equal to infinity, where again, infinity is really just representing a long time after the switch has changed state. So at T is equal to infinity, the circuit that we will have is gonna look something like this. So once again, I'm representing my inductor with a short circuit because a long time after the switch has changed state, we are making an assumption here that the circuit has settled back to some DC steady state response. Okay. I have an open circuit. <laughs> where my switch was because it has opened up and stayed open for a very long time. So here is my inductor current IL at infinity. Here is my inductor voltage at T is equal to infinity. Here is my resistor voltage at T is equal to infinity. Does anybody have any thoughts on what IL at infinity might be? Zero. Because effectively our inductor isn't connected to anything that would excite it, right? So if we come back to our plot, we can see that for T, greater than infinity, our inductor current is zero and it's a constant value. So this section of time also represents a DC steady state condition. Now, what's going on between these two times? So from 
zero to infinity is what's called the transient condition for the system. So this is when the system is undergoing some type of change and experiencing the effects of that change. In this case, that change is simply opening the switch, okay? So what we are going to do is we are going to do a little math and figure out how the inductor current behaves during this transient condition, okay? or zero plus the moment after the switch changes state is less than or equal to T is less than infinity our circuit is going to look like this So what we have is an RL circuit on the right hand side that has been disconnected from that practical source on the left hand side, okay? Now, because we are in this transient condition, we cannot say that we are at DC steady state. We have no reason to assume that. And so we cannot replace our inductor with a short circuit, okay? So we are having to use the inductor value and see what's going to happen. All right, so <clears throat> let's talk our way through what is physically happening, and then we are going to describe things with math, all right? So if I scroll up here just a smidge, I believe we can all agree that for all time less than or equal to T is equal to zero minus, our inductor, L, was carrying some fixed amount of current, IS. Are we all okay with that? What are the implications of an inductor carrying a fixed amount of current? It means it's storing a fixed amount of energy, right? As soon as we disconnect our switch or open up our switch and disconnect the practical current source, the inductor is going to start transferring energy back to everything that's connected to it. So effectively what is happening is that the inductor's stored energy will over time be turned into heat by the resistor R. And when we convert that electrical energy into heat energy, we should see that gradually the current flowing around that loop slowly decays towards zero when we've reached our DC steady state condition at T is equal to infinity. Okay. So we have energy stored. And then once we disconnect our excitation source, the practical source on the left hand side here, our energy storage element starts transferring whatever stored energy it has to whatever it's connected to, because there's nothing to keep the energy level capped at its value at T is equal to zero minus, okay? All right, so now we get into the math. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna apply Kirchhoff's voltage law around our right-hand loop, which simply will be 
VR plus VL is equal to zero. Are we all okay with that? Starting at the bottom left hand corner and going around that right most loop. Now I can express both VR of T and VL of T in terms of that inductor current IL of T, right? So VR is simply going to be R times IL of T using Ohm's law. I'm gonna erase this and move it down very slightly. And the voltage drop across an inductor is given by L di by dt. This, actually, let me ask you guys, do any of you guys know what this equation is or what type of equation this is? Differential equation. It's a first order homogeneous differential equation. Now, for those of you who haven't had Math 245, what we are about to do to solve this thing might look like magic, but we are just going to use effectively our intuition here. Okay, there are lots of mathematical background things that we could be going through. In fact, I have several pages of it written down, but it generally bores you guys to tears. So let's use our mathematical knowledge up to this point. So what this equation describes is that I have some function, I L of T, that's being multiplied by a simple coefficient, R. And then I have added to that L times the derivative of that same function. So what I'm looking for to solve this thing is a function <laughs> in which the function itself multiplied by a coefficient plus the derivative of the function multiplied by some coefficient can possibly add together to make zero. What function works? So I need the function and its derivative to effectively be of the same form so that I can linearly just add them together and somehow get zero. So let's just start with e to the x, a simple exponential function, and then we'll see whether or not a negative sign will pop up. The short answer is it absolutely will. But let's start with a basic assumption that a exponential function will satisfy our, our criterion. Because as we all know, the derivative of the exponential function is the exponential function. So it seems pretty reasonable that we can make this work, all right? So we are going to make a very educated guess that I L of T will be of the form A E to the S T amperes, okay? Where A represents how much we're scaling this exponential function by and that'll be related back to the circuit parameters in some way. And S represents the rate of exponential growth or the rate of exponential decay, which will also be able to be determined by manipulating <laughs> the circuit parameters, okay? So now what we're going to do is we're going to substitute this guess value into our equation, okay? So what we will have is R times AE to the ST plus L times the derivative with respect to time of AE to the ST is equal to zero. And now we're going to have to do a little bit of math. So this is going to look like R A e to the st. So 
So how do I take the derivative of this thing? Exactly right. S A E to the ST equal to zero. And now I'm just gonna do a little bit of algebra here, okay? So I have a common factor of A in both terms. So I'm gonna take that out. I have a common factor of E to the ST in both terms. So I'm gonna take that out. And what I'm left with is R plus S times L. And this expression has to be equal to zero. So let's talk about the different ways that we can make this thing zero, okay? So the first way that this expression is equal to zero is if A is equal to zero. What that solution represents is what's called a trivial solution in which there was no energy stored in the system to begin with. Effectively, if A is zero, then everything was zero and we don't really have an energy storage system. So while mathematically correct, it doesn't actually help us define what's going on. E to the ST will trend towards zero if S happens to be negative, but we don't really know what values of S would require. It doesn't really give us a lot of information either. So what we're gonna wind up doing is looking at this piece right here. Because this piece right here that I put with the red curly brace tells us the specific value of S, one individual value of S that will force this function to equal to zero, okay? So if I have R plus SL is equal to zero, what does S have to be? S must be negative R over L. Exactly right, thank you. So from here, we now can update our guess as to what the behavior of the system looks like, right? So we are now going to assume that IL of T will be of the form AE to the negative over LT, where S, our eigenvalue for this system or our natural frequency for this system is defined by the circuit parameters. Anybody have any thoughts on how we might figure out what value A has to have. So this equation is valid for T greater than or equal to zero plus all the way out to T is equal to infinity. So it has to hold true for IL at zero plus. So that's gonna be A E to the minus R over L times zero plus. Well, what's E to the zero? One. So if this whole thing right here is one at T is equal to zero, then that means A is simply the value of the inductor current the moment after the switch opened. From this, we can see IL of T can be expressed as IL at zero minus, which is valid for all T less than zero minus, and it will be IL at zero plus, e to the negative r over l times t, which is valid for t greater than or equal 
to zero plus. So we have mathematically described what the behavior of the inductor current is going to be doing in, uh, during the transient condition. So if you'll bear with me, I'm gonna scroll up here and we are going to draw what's happening. Our inductor current is gonna start at a value of IS at T is equal to zero. And then it is going to decay exponentially. That is not what I wanted to have happen. Like so, we're in this region, it's going to look simply like IS EXP negative R over L times time, where EXP is the exponential function, <laughs> another way of representing. So we have derived this very generically, right? Using a single resistor R that could be representative of the equivalent resistance of a system, a single inductance L that could be representative of the equivalent inductance of a system. We haven't used any numbers or anything like that. So what's great about that is that this is actually representative of any RL circuit that we will ever analyze. We never have to do all of this calculus again. The inductor current will always be described by this equation. Okay. Now, understanding that, let's look at a couple of other things here. So I'm going to scroll back up to our circuit for T is between zero plus and infinity. Okay. So our inductor current has that particular form that we have mathematically derived. What form do you think the resistor current is going to have to have? So if I were to define some resistor current, just for the sake of argument, let's put it like this. IR of T. How will the resistor current compare to the inductor current? They're the exact same thing, okay? If the resistor current has to have the same exponential form as the inductor current, what does that tell us about the form of the resistor voltage? The same exponential form. And then Kirchhoff's voltage law would tell us that the inductor voltage would also have to have that same exact form in order for Kirchhoff's voltage law to be valid. So we literally just learned this equation and I'm going to change things up. You'll, you'll thank me in a moment or maybe not, but you should. So instead of saying I L of T specifically here, what I'm going to say is Y of T is equal to y at zero minus, t less than zero minus, and y zero plus, e to the negative r over l times t, t greater than or equal to zero plus, where y simply represents any current or voltage in our system. So we can now apply this same equation to inductor current, inductor voltage, resistor current, resistor voltage. Everything is going to behave governed by this equation, okay? So let's work an example and prove it.
let's say that I have an 18 volt source connected to switch like so, and that our switch is opening at T is equal to zero. Then we will have ninety ohm resistor connected to a three millihenry inductor, which is in turn connected to. Fifty ohm resistor and a one hundred ohm resistor. Like so. Our quantities of interest will be our inductor current by L of T and our resistor voltage VR of T. So our first step will be to analyze our circuit at t is equal to zero minus. So at T is equal to zero minus, our circuit will look like this. Here we have our 18 volt source. Our switch is closed. Here we have our 90 ohm resistor. Here we have our 50 ohm resistor. Our 100 ohm resistor. Here is the R of zero minus. Here is L of zero minus. And we need to figure out each of these two quantities. So anybody have any thoughts or suggestions? You're absolutely correct. By inspection, the voltage VR is simply 18 volts because we have a single node pair circuit where everything is connected in parallel. And over on the left-hand side, we have a voltage source. So the voltage drop over everything at this point in time is simply 18 volts. So knowing that, how could we calculate IL of zero minus? So that's one way for sure. Um, put the 50, so uh, Mr. Finch's suggestion is to put the 50 in parallel with 100 and then 18 over that equivalent resistance will give us the current IL. I agree with that wholeheartedly. 
I'm going to do it in a slightly different form that winds up getting the exact same results. I'm going to do KCL and say that this is going to be 18 volts over 50 ohms plus 18 volts over 100 ohms. So mathematically, the exact same thing is what we would get, but I can do it in one step by applying KCL. So that's what I'm doing here. So 18 over 50 plus 18 over 100 comes out to be 27 over 50 amps. Does anybody have any questions, comments, or concerns regarding the analysis? And I use that term loosely here that we had to do for this. Everything seemed relatively straightforward. Nothing remotely new about this, right? Daniel. So the current IL at zero plus is the same as the current flowing through the 50 ohm resistor plus the current flowing through the 100 ohm resistor. The current flowing through the 50 is just 18 over 50. The current flowing through the 100 is just 18 over 100. Mm -hmm. And mathematically, this would look like 18 times 1 over 50 plus 1 over 100 which is the same thing as 18 divided by the equivalent resistance, which is what Mr. Fint suggested. So mathematically is literally the exact same thing as taking V divided by REQ, but this does it in one step, which is why I prefer it. All right, so yes, sir. So why did you short the... Okay, so at T is equal to zero minus, this represents a point in time where the switch has been closed for a very, very long time. So we, we are at DC steady state. T is equal to zero minus always represents a DC steady state condition. We scroll up here to the graph. We're at DC steady state until the switch changes state. And then a long time after the switch changes state, we are also at DC steady state. The DC equivalent of an inductor is a short circuit, right? That's one of the first relationships that we developed when we were looking at inductors. <laughs> we're about to use that second relationship here in the next step, okay? So any other questions regarding the analysis that we're doing here in step number one? What we're doing in this procedure is effectively breaking down this complex-ish circuit that requires calculus to analyze, and we're breaking it into discrete DC circuits that we can analyze and then plug stuff into our final value, okay, or final equation. All right, step number two. We are now going to analyze the circuit at T is equal to zero plus. So this is the moment in time after the switch has changed states. So we are now no longer in a DC steady state, which means our inductor is no longer behaving like a short circuit. Or a better way to put that would be, it might not be behaving like a short circuit because it is a possibility that it could be. So, what our circuit is going to look like is this. So here is our 18 volt source. Here is our 90 ohm resistor. I'm not going to draw anything for the inductor just yet. We're going to talk about some things. Here's our 50 ohm resistor. Here is our 100 ohm resistor. All right, so 
there are two effective schools of thought here as to how to treat the inductor, okay? Uh, I'm going to start with the one that probably is the most intuitively obvious, and then I'm gonna tell you the one that I actually use, all right? So the first thing that we could do is simply put our three millihenry inductor here, okay? This is our voltage drop, dr of zero plus. And this is our current, il of zero plus. So, thank you, you're right. Absolutely correct. Thank you so much. Which should be opened because we are at t is equal to zero plus. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, what do we know about the behavior of inductor currents? The inductor current cannot change abruptly. So, where that comes into play in circuits like these is that whatever value the inductor current had at T is equal to zero minus, it has to continue to have at the instant in time, T is equal to zero plus. It's going to decay after that, but we are not looking for, we're not analyzing this circuit at T greater than zero plus, which is what we did to come up with our differential equation and all that kind of stuff. We're taking a snapshot <laughs> of the circuit at the specific instant in time immediately after our switch opened, okay? So IL at zero plus has to equal IL at zero minus, it's 27 fiftieths of an amp. Now I'm gonna talk about the way that I prefer to illustrate this, okay? So as it's drawn right here, I find this arbitrarily confusing because I have to effectively just remember that the three millihenry inductor is carrying that same amount of current. Another way that we could think about this is that at this very specific instant in time in which the current flow flowing through the inductor has to have a specific value, regardless of the voltage drop over it, it is behaving like an independent current source, okay? So my preference is not to put a three millihenry inductor there, but instead an independent current source that has the same direction as IL and the same magnitude as IL at zero minus. And now this looks like a simple DC circuit yet again. <laughs> Under the constraint that the inductor current is not allowed to change from T is equal to zero minus to T is equal to zero plus, we can now calculate what's happening to the resistors, okay? Now, in this case, the voltage drop across the resistors is going to stay the same because the same amount of current is flowing through the equivalent resistance. That will not always be true, okay? While the current flowing through an inductor cannot change abruptly, the current flowing through resistors can, which means the voltage drop across a resistor can go from some value like 18 volts down to zero or literally any other number, and it will not have any effect. We're not breaking any rules or anything like that, okay? The inductor current in an RL system is the only quantity that cannot change abruptly. So here, this would look like 27 50ths of an amp 
times 50 ohms times 100 ohms over 50 ohms plus 100 ohms. That's just 50 in parallel with 100. And this should equal 18 volts. And we can throw it into our calculator to check just to make sure. And yeah, it comes out to be exactly 18. How could it not be? Rodian. So since we're getting a snapshot. In this specific instance, they are staying the same because the current flowing through them did not change because the current flowing through them is representative of an inductor current. So for this specific circuit, VR is not changing from zero minus to zero plus. In other circuits, it is absolutely a possibility, okay? But the configuration that we are dealing with is why the resistor voltage isn't changing. But it is okay if it does in other circuits. I just wanted to clarify that. All right. So any questions regarding our analysis or anything here? Okay. So one thing that I want to point out to you just to reiterate, the inductor current will not change from T is equal to zero minus to T is equal to zero plus. If you have it as two different numbers, you have made a mistake fundamentally, okay? Um, another thing that I want to point out to you all is that sometimes you will be asked questions on these types of circuits where you're not specifically asked what the inductor current is doing. The inductor current at T is equal to zero minus tells you how this circuit is going to behave later on. So even if you're not specifically asked to find it, you absolutely have to have it in order to pursue the circuit analysis, okay? I try to make a habit of telling you do this and the other thing I'm actually interested in, but I know for a fact on some of your homework problems, it just says you have this RL circuit or RC circuit and you just want some resistor voltage, it does not in any way, shape or form mention that you need to be paying attention to what the inductor is doing in the RL circuits or what the capacitor is doing in RC circuits. You always, always, always have to know at a minimum what that element is doing at T is equal to zero minus so that you can do your analysis at T is equal to zero plus properly. Okay, all right, so that's mini rant out of the way. So this next step that we are about to do is, if I'm being honest, kind of pointless. For this particular type of circuit, analyze the circuit at T is equal to infinity. So let me explain what I mean by this, okay? The circuit that we are analyzing is one in which our what I'm going to call our forcing function or our excitation function, our 18 volt source is removed from the circuit or from influencing the behavior of our inductor. So our expectation is that at T is equal to infinity, all of our quantities are going to go to zero because there's no, we're at DC steady state and there's no independent source making the value be anything other than zero, okay? That being said, what we're gonna cover in our next class meeting is what happens when, instead of the switch opening and disconnecting sources, what happens if we close the switch and connect sources? And then our analysis at T is equal to infinity will actually be required. So we are simply doing this to get you in the habit of maintaining this simple algorithm in order to plug things in here, okay? So at T is equal to infinity, We are gonna have our 18 volt source. Our switch is open. Thank you again for catching that mistake. We have our 90 ohm resistor. Since T is equal to infinity represents a DC steady state condition. Again, we are gonna replace our inductor with its DC steady state equivalent, the short circuit. Here 
is I L at infinity. Here is V R at infinity. And by inspection, we can see that I L of infinity is zero amps. And V R of infinity is zero volts. Again, in these situations where we're actually disconnecting sources from influencing the behavior of our energy storage element, the answer at infinity should always be zero. Once you guys get comfortable looking at the circuit and seeing what the switch is actually doing, you can completely and utterly ignore this step with no loss of information whatsoever, okay? Um, but it's good to get into the practice of doing it once you see um, what's called force response and total response, which is what we're gonna be talking about for our next class meetings. You're always gonna to have to analyze it at T is equal to infinity. And so this just literally represents a waste of 10 to 20 seconds of your time of drawing the circuit and being like, oh yeah, nothing's happening. So uh, it will also let you use effectively the exact same equation for every type of circuit that I could throw at you, which is always useful because you don't have to memorize conditional cases. All right, so step number four, will be to calculate LEQ and REQ for the system or circuit, okay? So we only have a single inductor here. So I feel pretty strongly that LEQ is just three millihenries because how could it be anything else? Right. To determine REQ is a potentially tricky thing, okay? And the reason why it's tricky is because we have to pay attention to what time we're doing it in, okay? So, we need LEQ and we need REQ so that we understand how our signal is exponentially decaying, right? These two values establish the rate at which the exponential decay occurs. So that means that we need LEQ and REQ during the transient condition. So we have to make sure that we're looking at the circuit during the transient. So for T greater than zero plus, okay? What we're looking for is the equivalent resistance as seen by the equivalent inductance, okay? So effectively what we're gonna do, we're seeing what resistance the energy storage element is distributing its energy to. So that's why it's the equivalent resistance as seen by our inductance, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use our Thevenin equivalent resistance rules here, okay? So during the transient condition, my circuit looks like this. Yeah, so this is what my circuit looks like, okay? So during the transit condition, our switch is open. We have everything here, okay? We're trying to find the equivalent resistance from the perspective of the inductor, which means we remove the inductor from the circuit and we're looking in through the terminals where the inductor was. So I take my inductor out. Like so, and I'm looking in through here find my equivalent resistance. Now, because I'm making a Thevenin equivalent resistance measurement, I need to make sure that I'm looking at a dead network. 
So I have to turn off any independent sources I have. So my 18 volt source here should look like a short circuit. And then at this point, I should be able to use just simple resistor combination techniques in order to find the equivalent resistance. So to me, REQ looks like 90 ohms plus 50 ohms in parallel with 100 ohms. Does anybody see anything different? So the reason why I'm asking that is because a lot of you guys will see a configuration like this and say that it's actually 90 in parallel with 50 in parallel with 100, which isn't true because the 90 ohm resistor isn't in parallel with those guys on the right because they don't share both sets of terminals. It's just a common mistake that I see you guys continue to make, especially when we circle back around to this stuff. So I just wanted to make you aware of it. You can always use the simple resistor combination techniques that we developed on the third or fourth day of class to figure this out. Identify your nodes, play connect dots with resistors and whatever you get is REQ, okay? So mathematically, uh, excuse me, our numerical answer for this is then going to be, uh, let's see, 90 plus 50 times 100 over 150, 370 over three. All right. Um, there's a, a different thing that we could do here, but I'm not ready to introduce that just yet. Okay, so our next step, and this is our last step, is to Effectively just plug and shut. We have a generic equation that we can use to determine our quantities of interest or how our quantities of interest are behaving as a function of time, because we know what all of the little constituent pieces to plug into that equation are, right? So plug and chug into a generic So our generic equation is y of t is equal to y zero minus for t less than zero minus y at zero plus e to the negative r e q over l e q times time greater than or equal to zero plus. So from this, our inductor current as a function of time. So what was our inductor, uh, inductor current at t is equal to zero minus? All right, what was our inductor current at t is equal to zero plus? The same thing. Sorry, thank you. Doing it in this form just because we're about to have an odd looking number. Um, so this would be 370 over three ohms divided by three millihenry. And then this whole thing is multiplied by time. for t greater than or equal to zero plus. So there's nothing technically wrong with this form, but I find it annoying to have fractions inside of fractions being multiplied by time. I prefer it to just be a single coefficient, effectively the S value. So 370 over three divided by 
divided by three milla is Three hundred and seventy thousand over nine. So for our resistor voltage, VR of T, we would have eighteen volts for T less than zero minus, and then eighteen E to the negative three hundred and seventy thousand over nine T volts for t greater than or equal to zero plus. And we could have gotten this result by just plugging things directly into our generic equation or literally <laughs> multiplying our inductor current by that equivalent resistance and we would get the exact same result. Okay. All right. Um, so I am mildly conflicted here. So let me explain what I mean by that. I have talked for an hour and 10 minutes straight. Um, I think it would be a good use of you guys time to work on the in-class assignment um, to practice this kind of stuff. The problem with that is that the in-class assignment has a problem involving an RC circuit on there, which we have not yet discussed. So I can very quickly go through the derivation for RC circuits. It's extraordinarily similar to what we did for RL circuits. The only change in our analysis procedure literally would come here in step number four, where we're calculating CEQ instead of REQ. So do you want me to burn through the RC circuit material very quickly or start with that Friday morning? Now, okay. So here goes our RC circuit analysis. So if we have the following circuit or something similar to it, in which we have a voltage source connected to an RC network. Like so. Um, let's consider this to be our capacitor voltage, this to be our resistor current. And this to be our capacitor part, okay? So without going through all of the steps and stuff again, really thinking about this, it should be fairly obvious that when the switch is closed, the capacitor is storing some energy. When we open the switch, the capacitor is gonna transfer its energy to the resistor and it should behave roughly like the RL circuit would because they are electrical duels of each other, right? So at, or zero less than, uh, excuse me, zero plus less than or equal to T less than infinity. What we are going to have is effectively this circuit with the switch opened and Kirchhoff's current law tells us that IR plus IC is equal to zero where IR be expressed as VC over R, and IC could be expressed as C DVC by DT. And what do you know? We have another first order homogeneous linear differential equation. We are going to guess that VC in this case will be of the form AE DST. If we plug this in, what we find is that we have one over R multiplied by AE to the ST plus 
C S A E to the S T is equal to zero or A times one over R plus S C times E to the S T is equal to zero. From this, we can see that S will be equal to negative one over R C. Therefore, VC of T will be A E to the negative T over R C. A here will just be VC at zero plus because this equation has to be valid for t is equal to zero plus. So from that, vc of t will be vc at zero minus for t less than zero minus and vc of zero plus e to the negative t over rc t greater than or equal to zero plus. Since the capacitor voltage and the resistor voltage are the same thing, then obviously the resistor voltage needs to be of the same form. Using Ohm's law, we could see that the resistor current needs to be of the same form. And using Kirchhoff's current law, the capacitor current has to be of the same form. So instead of using this specific form for VC, we could use it for all different elements. So our generic equation is then simply Y of T is equal to Y of zero minus for T less than or equal to zero minus and Y of zero plus E to the negative T over RC for T greater than or equal zero plus but effectively it's the same damn equation except that the coefficient on t and the exponent is different for rc circuits than it is for rl circuits and we will talk about that briefly at the beginning of next class as i introduce the concept of the time constant all right in class assignment time